So let's just get started. Yeah. So what I was saying is uh, today I have sort of an ambitious topic. I actually want to go over all the basics of machine learning. And this is sort of going to sound like straight up insane because uh, typically you do need time. Like you need to code a lot of stuff. You need to read a lot of math. Uh, you know, you need to have projects. Like, sorry, I'm just disabling my email. So, so typically, like, there's a lot, there's a lot you need to learn, and really, you needed a lot to learn, I would say, to become really good. But the basics, I think, are relatively like eighty percent of the stuff that you need to know. I would say are contained in these two books. So the first one is Data Science from Scratch from Joel Gruss. Um, the interesting thing about this book is that it goes over like basic code from scratch, like as in how do you design a linear algebra library from scratch, how do you design an ML library from scratch, etc. And then the, the second one, 100 page machine learning book is more of a, I'd say theoretical book that goes over like sort of the math that you need to know for ML. I really think both of these books are amazing. They're very complimentary. So I'm just gonna really be going over both of them cover to cover during the stream. Um, and I've actually done this many times myself already. Like I, I would say every year, every two years or so, like I, I'll, you know, go, go through these books, especially data, like 100 page ML book is a bit newer, but uh, data science from scratch I've read many, many times now. Uh, so I can give you a good insight and sort of give you like a much more condensed version by going through the course. So Grasspop is saying, I'm a high school student interested in tech and I've took two Udacity courses. Yeah, you're actually way further along than I was in high school. When I was in high school, all I was doing was, you know, playing chess and playing video games. Like that was about it. <laughs> so good, <laughs> good job. Anyway, let's get started. So hands-on machine learning. Uh, yeah, so I, so I have a couple of questions about different books. So... Hands-on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. It's a, it's a good book. It's not one of my favorites, I would say. And then uh, the second question is from Hawkmonk asking, did you read Kevin Murphy's book and do you have any opinions on it? Uh, Kevin Murphy's book is good, but I don't think it's a good first book. Like I think reading these first and sort of getting the very basics of how the code works, the very basics of the math, and then you can go to Kevin Murphy's book once you want to get a bit more serious and understand some of the theoretical underpinnings. But in my case, like Kevin Murphy's book was actually my first book. And I, uh, I mean, it, it, and, and at the time, like, it's not like machine learning was as crazy popular as it is now. So it, there weren't as many people writing accessible content about it. Um, that said, it's still a great book. And if you can read it and enjoy it, you know, go for it. Don't let me stop you. Uh, I just can't say that I enjoyed it as a first book. I certainly enjoyed it when I came back to it as I, as I, knew, as I knew a bit more ML. So yeah, like I said, like, uh, please bring your questions to the stream. Like, uh, you know, that's so, sort of the whole point of this specific stream, right? So first off, like, uh, you know, so this is the 100 page ML book. We're gonna cover it because it's very short, right? And so it'll give us a good idea of all the theory and then we can start like looking at code and, and have a good sense of how everything works. All right, so blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. So the, really the, the main paradigm, like, sorry, like it's just, it's just really bright. Can't see. Okay, I live in San Diego, so all of you living in, in colder areas, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so typically when we talk about ML and learning in general, there's sort of three main paradigms, right? Like they're supervised, uh, semi-supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Um, I, I think of supervised and semi-supervised as being the same, uh, but like I will discuss the difference in a second. Um, and the let's, let's just go over them one by one because I think just talking through them theoretically is not going to make too much sense. Um, so the main idea with, with supervised learning is that you can think of yourself as you have like a bunch of labeled examples. So you have, uh, I like to think of these as a table. Let's go here. So assume you have like some sort of, let's do black first. Yeah, so assume you have like this table, right? Uh, and then you, you have like a bunch of columns. And you have a bunch of rows. This row is your Y. Right? So this goes from zero to N, which is number of examples. And then this goes from uh, zero to K, which is the number of uh, features, right? And so with supervised learning, what you're really trying to do is basically you're saying, well, given X, 
So given x, uh, predict y, right? And so that, that sounds obvious enough, right? Like you can like, let's say learn a function. Like, so basically by given x predict y, I'm really saying uh, learn f such that f of x is, you know, about equal to y or equal to y really. Um, and so the way you do this is you basically pretend like you can't look, you can't see y. Like, even though you know what it is, you, you pretend like you don't, you can't see it. You learn an f and then you can figure out how good your f is by looking at the actual y. So basically there's the like y predicted, right? Versus y actual. And then use this to improve uh, your guess of f. So we'll talk about really how this guess is improved, but just like as a sneak peek, and if you've seen this kind of content before, uh, then really, you know, what you're doing is, is an you're using an algorithm called gradient descent to, to, to solve this uh, specific problem. So I'll go over all of this, like everything will be explained in depth. Um, right, so when we say label, like when we say y, really like y can take various shapes, right? So y could be a zero, one value, right? Like zero, one means, uh, let's say, are you a cat or not cat, right? But it could also be like a, like a value. It could be, for example, like, let's say, I don't know, 10,000. And you're basically, let's say, predicting uh, income of a person. Or like the most boring example that is often mentioned in ML books is try to predict the price of real estate in uh, uh, of a certain house. Like that's the sort of hello world of, of regression. So this is called the classification. Uh, and this is called uh, regression. So in like so so if we have supervised, right? So this is supervised, all of this stuff. Right? Well, what is semi-supervised? So typically, uh, you know, y is a label right and so label means there's a human labeling it instead though you can build them you can sort of pretend like you're taking the supervised learning setting and sort of trick it and so this is sort of a, the main trick used in algorithms like BERT or transformers and uh, GPT like all those like epic transformers that people talk about a lot in the media uh, and so the way they do it is that let's say you have a like a bunch of words like let's say mark is an ML explainer, right? And so the idea here is that you basically pretend like you can't look at the word ML, and then you build the function that can take in the vector mark is an something explainer and predict ML, right? So even though it's not really supervised, you're getting a label from the data itself. And this is why we call this semi-supervised learning. So wh why would you want to do this? Like, well, you know, data, like, like let's say some data, like getting labels is expensive, but some data is essentially free. Like getting more online content is essentially free because people are going to keep typing stuff on the internet and you're going to just have like more data as, as you go along. So, the difference now is that like, well, like what's left, right? We also have the idea of uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, and what unsupervised learning is, is basically there's no why. And what that means is that like, well, you need to learn something. And the most common uh, thing that people do in unsupervised learning is really an algorithm called uh, like, an, sorry, a family of algorithms called clustering. And what clustering is like, let's say you have a bunch of X's like X1 to Xn. And you're trying to find, let's say, try to find uh, k clusters. Uh, let's call them x uh, one to k, uh, such that the distance between uh, x uh, k and uh, x uh, i uh, is minimal. It's like it's, yeah, so it's smaller than for any other. Uh, let's say like this dash means like basically not not the specific index uh, and every other and, and this point. So sorry, this is just like convoluted notation to really say that um, we're trying to find the cluster such that the distance between all points in the data set to each of their assigned clusters is minimized. 
Um, and so clustering is useful basically as a data visualization technique. Uh, it's also used basically as a compression technique. Uh, it, it's sort of foundational. I personally haven't found much like professional use for clustering in general besides just sort of getting started a new ML project. Uh, that said, a lot of ideas are, are relevant, especially in proofs for supervised learning and stuff. So the last paradigm is called reinforcement learning. And uh, what reinforcement learning basically is, is you can imagine it's sort of a very different setting. You have some agent and it basically is acting in some environment. So it takes an action in an environment. Like think of like this could be, let's say, a, like a vacuum cleaner robot in your apartment. Uh, it moves. And once it moves, the environment either gives it like uh, gives it a reward and a new state. And what state here really means is uh, like did the robot move something. So this is like all the robot sensors getting updated and stuff. Uh, and so the idea is if we're in a setting like this, as long as you're getting some rewards, you can basically improve uh, agent uh, such that uh, reward is maximized. Yeah, hey, Chris, nice, nice to see you. I was just talking about you earlier. All right, so, 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 so like just, you know, zooming out a bit. Uh, these are sort of like, uh, so, so yeah, so today's topic is all the basics of machine learning. Like I'm going to be covering two books, Data Science from Scratch and 100-page ML. I'm going to be going cover to cover and explaining how everything works. I don't know how long this is going to take, but it's definitely an ambitious stream today. So these are sort of like the four main paradigms of machine learning. We have supervised learning, some like where you have a label and you pretend like you're not looking at it. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, where you basically uh, like fake a label from the data set itself unsupervised learning where you have no label and then reinforcement learning where you have an agent acting with an environment. So this is really here what they, they say something really similar. Um, and here, let's do this. So this is a, this is a more specific example. Let's go. Uh, I don't like this one here. Okay, yeah, so here it's like just like some typical mathematical notation that you'll see a lot. Uh, you know, if you have a sum of a whole bunch of stuff, you know, you use the summation operation. Uh, if you have a product of a bunch of stuff, you'll use the, the pi, like this, like capital pi. Uh, and you use these a lot. Like, I mean, uh, and, and one way to think about them is that really these are a for loops in code, right? Like these are, like a summation is a for loop, like you're adding stuff, so like four. Like basically this is uh, for uh, x i uh, in x uh, sum uh, equals zero, right? And then the sum plus uh, equal x i, right? So uh, a lot of times, like I think I'll definitely encourage you, like when you're looking at uh, like uh, equations, like try to think about like what the code actually looks like. It often makes stuff a lot simpler. Um, so yeah, so really like, you know, and, and so now when we're thinking about some of the stuff, uh, I also want to talk about, uh, yeah, let's see here, I think, yeah, see, this is like, whoa, whoa, this is like super basic, actually, I just realized. Um, yeah, let's talk about these for a second. So uh, another thing is like, uh, like, like matrix math, right? So if you have two matrices, let's just briefly talk about matrices. Right, so a matrix will look something like this. And th there's a couple of, you know, like in ML, typically you're working with like a couple of this. So you're working with scalars, right? So a scalar would be uh, A1. Uh, a vector would be uh, like A1 to AN. And then a matrix is uh, a1 uh, to let's say an and then let's say it's called like a1n and then a1k and then all the way to a n k for example so this is just like the notation of a uh, apologies so yes yeah, so this is notation of a matrix this is notation of a vector this is notation of a scalar so a lot of times like people will i think overestimate the complexity of deep learning but i would say like overall the math that you need in deep learning is very slim like you basically need to know like 
how to derive a function. Like as a, sorry, take the derivative. And then ba like basic uh, matrix math, I think is, is very important. Uh, so the, the most uh, important property I think about matrices that is very counterintuitive is that like you can't like the order matters, right? So a B in general is not equal to B A. Right. This was very, very confusing for me when I was first starting out because, you know, for scalars, this is certainly not the case, right? Like five times three is equal to three times five. Right. Um, so what, why is this not the case for matrices? So it sort of depends how you think about it. Like, so if you think of a matrix as like this blob of data, you know, if you like, there's two interpretations of a matrix, right? Uh, so now we're talking like, you know, it's like almost like physics, like what is, is light a particle or uh, is, is, it, is it matter or light? Like, you know, is it, sorry, is it a wave or is it a particle? So one interpretation is to view it as data, right? But the other interpretation is to view it as a function. And if you view it as a function, then a uh, basically the matrix A means you're going from a space, let's say, uh, let's say you're going from space X to space Y. And then matrix B is a function that takes you, let's say from space uh, Y to space uh, X, right? And so if you view it that way, then AB is not a multiplication, it's a composition. And it's a function that takes you from X Actually, yeah, I need to call this Z, sorry. It takes you from X to Z. And then B composed with A is a function that actually takes you from Z to X. You know, and obviously these are not the same thing, right? Like you, there, there's no way a function, like it's closer to the inverse, right? In this case, uh, it, it's not the same at all. Um, so yeah, like this will save you a lot of time. Uh, maybe I'll do another stream about this topic in of itself, but I would highly recommend the uh, linear algebra done right textbook. It's very, very good. And feel free to check it out. I think the author made it free online recently. All right, so now if we go, okay, let's keep going. So uh, typically, uh, you know, like we're sort of building up the foundation of, of, of what we need for the, for the rest of this uh, tutorial, right? Like all of this math will, uh, will make a lot of sense soon. Uh, but basically, you know, remember when I told you here, where was it? So I told you here that we're really trying to find uh, a function f of x such that it's pretty close to y, right? So another way to view that is well, that means it's f of x minus y is about zero, right? So then if you were to draw this, right? What we're basically asking is find the minimum, right? So finding the minimum then goes like, well, we're trying to find, uh, so let's say f, now let's be a bit more specific, right? Um, how do you find the minimums of functions in general? So there's, you know, one trick we learned, which is basically if you want to find the minimum of a function, or really not the minimum, the minimums and the maximums, right? Uh, what you basically do is you basically take the derivative of this function and set the derivative equal to zero, and it's gonna give you all the mins and the maxes, right? Because the derivative measures a rate of change. And at these points here and here, the slope is flat, and that corresponds to points where the derivative is equal to zero. All right, so now let's be a bit more specific. Like, let's say our function was actually wx, for example. All right, so I remember we're doing matrix algebra. So w is like the weights of your model, weights. X is your input. Right, wx minus y, your label. And we wanna set the derivative of this thing to zero, right? So the way we do that is we say, well, we wanna take wx, d of wx with respect to w, right? Minus y equals to zero. This is an easy function to derive. So really what you're taking is 
uh, x minus y equals to zero. Therefore, uh, this function is minimal whenever x is equal to y, for example. So this is just like another uh, you know, simple example. This is not a very useful model like y because remember, what does wx look like? <laughs> wx looks like this, right? Uh, this is wx. Uh, and so then we get to more, so, so this is just like an example of a model that's like very poor to fit. And so to make this more expressive, what we'll end up doing is we'll generally have a model like wx plus b. That way you can move this, right? And so you can have this and this and this. and These are all different versions of Wx plus p. And you're trying to learn the best one that fits your data. Uh, you know, but a natural question may be, well, you know, why stop at Wx? Like, why not have uh, W, uh, you know, X, like, like Wx squared uh, plus Wx plus b? Uh, this maybe lets you do, like now this lets you do parabolas, right? Now you can draw functions that look like this. Um, and so the point is, in general, like basically more complex models in general uh, will fit better. Like they, they fit your data better, uh, but they will generalize worse. And this is called the bias uh, variance trade-off. Like, so basically you want a model that's simple enough to fit the data well. Uh, but you don't want it to be too complicated such that uh, you fit your test data perfectly, but on your training data, it doesn't do that much of a good job. Um, so here again, like they, they, they do exactly this, right? They do exactly what I talked about, which is you take a function and then you set its derivative equals to zero. Um, and yeah, so here they, they talk about the idea of a random variables and unbiased estimators. Uh, this idea, I think, is important, but uh, we can skip it, I think, for now, because it doesn't come up too much. Uh, a really important rule that I think is important to mention is Bayes' rule, right? So Bayes' rule, uh, so, so yeah, so Bayes' rule or also Bayes' theorem uh, is a way to basically figure out, like, well, uh, like given a probability distribution that looks like this, a conditional one. So basically, what this is saying is like, given that, so given that my label is this. Uh, what is the most likely variable, like, like what is the most likely value for my random variable? And so you can do this by like flipping this and typically this you'll know because these are counts. Uh, and if you have this, that means you can solve this. So this is used a lot, for example, in let's say like studies, like trying to determine like, uh, you know, like let's say I tell you something like, I'll just give you some homework and you can like resolve it later. But the typical example is, uh, you know, let's say you take the take the COVID. So let's say you take the the COVID uh, PCR test, right? And it says you're positive. Like you do indeed have COVID. Uh, my question is, uh, given that, so. Okay, so given that the test says you're positive, what's the probability uh, that you actually have COVID? Right, so just think about this problem. Uh, and it, you know, and, and I actually didn't give you the full problem definition. Like you need to, you know, maybe ask me more questions. Maybe I'll answer them along as, as we go in the stream. But, you know, I want you to think about, uh, you know, how, like, does it matter if you're symptomatic or asymptomatic for you to make this calculation? Uh, you know, do you need to know roughly how many people in the global population have COVID versus don't? Uh, you know, so sort of one thing to think about, but Bayes' rule will help you solve this problem. All right, so yeah, think about it and enjoy. Um, so I talked briefly about this, but there, there's a difference between uh, regression and classification. So classification is basically giving a label that's binary. So think of there's like a discrete number of values, like let's say, uh, what animal is this image, right? And so there's even like, there's not an infinite amount of animals. There's a lot, you know, but there's not an infinite amount. 
uh, whereas like with regression, like let's say if I were to say predict your, predict your income, well, there's an infinite amount of values that your income can take because you can also have fractionals. And so uh, basically in regression, we a classification, we call this like a label. And in regression, we call this a target. The machine learning for how this stuff, like the way the models actually work is they, they, they vary uh, very slightly. Like they just vary in the way the loss function is computed. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but there's basically a way to turn any architecture that works for regression into classification problem using something like a, what's called a softmax. So we'll, we'll talk about how this works in a second. All right, so another thing I want you to think about uh, is uh, the sort of this difference that people make between shallow and deep learning, right? And so uh, really uh, here, the, the, the thing I want you to remember, you know, like I think people get too hung up on nomenclature. Like what is machine learning? Like what is AI? What is, uh, uh, you know, shallow learning? What is deep learning? Personally, I don't find these questions very interesting because the way I figure it's more like, well, like what techniques are useful? I'll use these. Uh, but one thing that's helped me classify them a bit is that uh, sort of the main classification algorithm is called a logistic regression. It's the most popular one. We'll cover it probably very soon in this uh, in this stream. And logistic regression is basically like you can think of it as you know you have like this w x plus b, uh, and then you have your x and you want to predict your y, right? And so this is like a single layer, whereas with a deep model it actually looks like this. You have like X and then you have a W X plus B. Then you have another W X plus B. Then you have another W X plus B. Then you have Y, right? So that's the difference. Like when people talk about depth is how many times you're composing the same layer. It's also why, and I think Krishnan will know this, like I really hate the neuron analogy for neural networks because I think it does more harm than good in helping you understand like how this stuff actually works. Think of them as matrix networks. Because W, X plus B, you know, like, what did I say, right? Like, a matrix is a function, right? So W, X is a function on Xs. So, again, like, think of it as you're composing matrices, as in you're composing functions. Uh, don't think of neurons. Like, I don't think they're very useful to think about. All right, so uh, one problem that's, uh, yeah, so, so this is sort of like one of the core, core algorithms in machine learning right now. So... Uh, sorry, not right now. Like just historically, it's one of the most popular ones. It's called like linear regression. So this is sort of the meme here is that like a lot of people that, you know, started off like doing Excel, like in finance, like they've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. They just didn't market themselves as, you know, machine learning experts. So then, you know, maybe they don't make as much money or who knows. Like, I think actually finance people do make a good amount of money. A lot of it is probably not not that deserved, honestly. But but yeah, so you can think of it as like we're trying to build a model to try and predict like a like a label, right? Like or sorry, a target in the case of regression. So we're gonna do this by having a w x plus b. And so like remember, look at what's given, right? Like we know what x is, right? We know what i should be, right? Because x is our data, so we know this. What we don't know is what our w and b should be and what our what our w should be and what our uh, w and what our b should be. Okay, I see why I got confused. Right? And so you can think of it as eventually like what what are you learning? You're learning a line, right? Like that's that's actually just the, this is this formulation is a function of a line, right? So you're learning a line. And so well, how do you find w and and the b, right? So one way to do it is that here what they're doing is they're saying, "Okay, well, we're going to look at the difference between our prediction and the actual label. So that's y, and then f of x is our prediction. But then instead of just taking the difference between them, we're gonna take the squared difference. Uh, you know, if anyone wants to make a guess for why we do this, like please type it in chat right now. Why do we take squared distances? Why don't we just take a regular distance? I'll give you a second. All right, so the, so the reason we, so easy to differentiate. Yeah, that's right. So one is like when you're taking, remember like the way we're actually gonna compute optimal values for this is we're gonna take the derivative of this, right? So what's the, deriv the derivative of d of x squared over x? Right, this is two x, right? And so it's very easy to differentiate, but there's also another major benefit to this. Uh, 
which is that basically distances are always positive, right? So we, we don't care, like, let's say you're making a prediction. Let's say you predicted that Y should be this, like this is the actual Y. Whether your prediction is here or here, you know, let's say this is more positive error and this is negative. It sort of doesn't matter. What cares is how far away you are from it. And that's why we take the squared. So natural questions like, why don't we take the absolute value? And you're certainly right. You could certainly take the absolute value. But the absolute value has this other problem where it's a bit uh, trickier to differentiate, right? Because uh, it's not continuous, right? Like, look at it. So the x squared looks like this, right? It's continuous. This is a, a x squared. What does uh, absolute value of x look like? Well, it looks like this. All right, another interesting puzzle. So you may have heard of something called uh, L1 and uh, L2 loss. Right. And so one thing that people talk a lot about is L1 promotes like sparse uh, values and L2 promotes small values. Uh, looking at these, can you sort of guess why that's the case? So this is L1, this is L2. Notice by the way, I'm asking questions whenever I'm having a sip of coffee. All right, so the reason why like one gives small values and the other one gives sparse values is that you can imagine like, let's say you're here, right? And you're like navigating down the slope. This is a much harsher slope than this one. Like, so here, if you're going down like by a step on this function, you're going down a lot more slowly versus here, you're going down a lot more harshly. And so as a result, because it's so easy to go to zero, what ends up happening is most values in your model are going to be zero. And that's why L1 promotes sparsity. I've seen all sorts of complicated explanations for how this works. I've personally found this picture to make the most sense is that like, imagine you're taking a step along, along the loss function. In one case, it's going to be a step is quickly going to take you to zero. And in one case, it's going to very slowly take you to zero notice. So here, if you're here, your value is going to go down a lot. But if you're here, you're going to go very slowly down. It's going to take many, 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 many steps for you to get to zero. So this is why L1 sparse, L2 small, right? These are the same thing in some way, but sparse really means zero, right? Versus small means close to zero, but not zero. Right? So here are people like, again, like, so I sort of talked about the bias variance straight off. So think of it this way. Uh, so we see this example, right? So let's say you look at these points. And if you just visually inspect it, you would imagine that the model that fits this data best is some sort of line that goes like this, right? And this line has a single, has two parameters, right? It has W and it has B. Instead, you could take a 10th degree. By 10th degree, that means like you take uh, X, you take X squared all the way to X to the power 10. And lo and behold, you can fit this, this data really really well like every point you know but what ends up happening is you when you end when you end up trying to generalize this data this model to un unseen data uh, it's just gonna end up having really really bad performance and this is what the bias uh, variance straight off is so we've talked about linear regression right and so this is the sort of hello world of regression of machine learning it's the simplest machine learning algorithm you can think about what logistic regression is is it's sort of the simplest classification algorithm you can have. And you may wonder, why the fuck is this called logistic regression? I would agree. I would say this should be called logistic classification. And this would be much more indicative of what this algorithm actually does. So how are we going to classify stuff? So imagine that, like, it's very similar to a regression, right? Like, let's say you're going to predict some value. And let's say this value is... Uh, you know, there, it, it can take up values from like minus 100 to 100. What you want to end up doing is you want to turn these values to take values between 0 and 1. And so this is what the logistic function does. So you're basically trying to turn this into a range that's smaller. And then what you do is you set a threshold, right? And so let's say your model ends up with this transformation predicting 0 0.6. Well, you can go, well, okay, well, zero, if, if 0 0.6 is larger than 0 0.5, therefore predict class one. 
And if let's say you predicted instead 0 0.2 and that's less than 0 0.5, then you say, I want to predict uh, class uh, zero. So by class one, class zero, I, I mean like, let's say this could be cat and then this is not cat. So anytime you have something that works for regression, often it's just a question of, re of adding a logistic function uh, on top of it. Uh, and so there, there's a couple of examples of logistic functions. Like there's many functions you could have that do this, but the most famous one is this one. This is called, uh, so basically, yeah. So it's one over one plus e to the minus x. So there's multiple reasons why this function is chosen. Like one is, is that it's smooth, right? And it's, it's differentiable everywhere. Like that means that there's no sudden jumps anywhere. Uh, the other thing about it that's, that's interesting um, is that its derivative is very nice. Right, so its derivative is actually so d of f of x uh, over uh, of d of x uh, is equal to logistic of x times one minus logistic of x. Sorry, yeah, it's like not not very clear. Uh, here, let me, let me go down. Uh, but in general, like you know, when you want to think about this, is that like well, uh, it, like it's it has like it's a smoothly differentiable function. It maps arbitrary values to a range of between zero and one, because the function itself takes as an input any value you want. It just always spits out this zero to one range. Um, and then when I when I was saying this, like, well, how do you do this mapping, right? Well, that's what functions do. Like functions map from one space to another, and so you basically pass in uh, here, like instead of one over one over plus e to the minus x, it would be one over one plus e to the minus w x plus b. Right, so great. So so now, what well, we know what our f looks like. So how do we solve this, right? How how do we find the best possible uh, w and b? Um, and so the algorithm here is, is basically called, uh, you know, like like we basically use a criterion in a lot of uh, ML algorithms called like the the maximum likelihood, uh, like 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 called like maximum likelihood, as in what's the most likely values that would fit this data that we're seeing. Right, like what's the most likely w that could predict this this x? And so remember when I told you about the derivative, right? So this is the logistic times one minus logistic. So this shows up exactly here, right? So you have this, you you, you have the, the you have the function. So sort of a sorry, a similar shape. And let's go over this this function a bit because it because it looks kind of complicated. So let's assume like so y i is our label, right? So let's say, so here it's it's two classes. Now let's assume y i is equal to one. In which case, one minus y i is gonna be equals to zero. So this whole thing becomes one. And then what your loss becomes, your loss basically becomes like the, like, like, like just your actual uh, prediction, right? Otherwise, if y i is equal to zero, so actually you're for like, like your class is, is class zero, then this becomes zero and your prediction is actually should, your loss is one minus f of x of x, f of x, y. Um, so yeah, so let's see here, like log. Okay, uh, another common trick is like, remember here when like, you know, you're basically taking this loss and you're taking it over every single uh, example in uh, in a data set, right? So this is what the one to n is. So you basically take the loss uh, and you're basically saying, well, the probability of me seeing example one with these weights is 0 0.1. Uh, you know, the way you aggregate probabilities is a multiplication. So the probability, let's say of, uh, you know, this, this, this model fitting this data point is 0 0.1. Let's say there's two data points, the second data point is 0 0.2. Then the aggregate probability for fitting both of them is 0 0.1 times 0 0.2. Uh, right, so this is how you aggregate probabilities. What ends up happening is that all of your values are between zero and one, right? And you're going to multiply a whole bunch of them. What ends up happening is you get integer underflow. So you basically you have all of these small values multiplied uh, gives you uh, underflow on modern computers. And so what you can do is like, instead of using, like whenever you're working with multiplications, like, you know, when people, when you're thinking about like, what, what, why are logs useful? The reason logs are useful is because they turn multiplications into additions. So you're doing a, instead of doing an addition in normal space, you're uh, in multiplication in normal space, you're doing an addition in log space. And so this is where this log comes in, right? So log has a couple of interesting, so, so one notice here, like, well, like we have one, this product turned into a sum, right? Yeah, I'm just going to do this. 
what's the other change, right? You see these powers, like these powers are now here, right? And so we can just like look, like just look up the basic properties of log again, in case you forgot them. Log of power. Where is it? Yeah, like log has a couple of nice properties. Like one, the derivative is just one over log, right? The power rule basically like, look, so this multi this uh, exponentiation uh, turns into a single multiplication, right? So exponential is also very expensive. Uh, like relatively, like it takes log, uh, I, I believe multiplication takes, uh, how much does it take? So if you're splitting it up, uh, I think you can do log n calculation, log n multiplications. Yeah, yeah, so you do log n multiplications instead. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this is this is why logs are useful. Like, you know, you look at it, you know, you, you can do this. You have easy derivatives, you, you know, multiply here. This is the, like, the product rule basically is two things multiplied. Then you just, like, end up adding them. So a lot of times, like, whenever in ML papers, you'll see lots of stuff being multiplied and people replace it by log. It's not because logs are have this magical property. It's really just, like, a convenience thing to work with additions because it makes your life easier. Right, so this is this explains a bit more like how this formula is constructed, like the original one. So if y i is the positive class, the likelihood y being the positive class according to our model is given by p. And similarly, if it's the negative class, the likelihood of it given the negative class is given by one minus p. So, th so there's a couple of other, uh, you know, like you can't sort of assume that everything is is deep learning. Like, I mean, kind of. Like, I mean, it, it is probably not more useful right now than, than other techniques, but there's others that are pretty useful. One of them is decision trees and you know, why are they interesting? So with decision trees specifically, yeah, let's go up here. So for example, let's say you're trying to classify like is something a salmon or a tuna, right? So the first thing you'll look at it, like, is it like the size? Is it like bigger than, I don't know, a meter or smaller than a meter, right? And so if it's, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. Let's see, bigger, smaller. I Sorry, I get confused with these sometimes, the order. Um, yeah, but anyway, like let's say if it's bigger, that's probably more likely to be a, a tuna, right? Because tuna are huge. Uh, so you're like, okay, well, it's probably a tuna. And then like, let's say you look at the color uh, to really confirm and if it's like well if it's orange and it's big well it could still be a sal it could be a big salmon otherwise if it's gray it most certainly is a tuna for example so this is like you know one way to do a decision tree <coughs> <coughs> the interesting thing about them <coughs> um, is that like you can debug it like you can actually look at the order of decisions being made and you can sort of figure out well how do i need to change this thing and and to come up with good predictions. All right, so this is zooming in a bit more. Um, however, you know, like it's probably like if you're gonna just be designing these rules yourself, it's also gonna be a pain in the ass. So uh, there, there's actually the decision tree algorithm where you can design your own trees and this is the way it works. All right, so the, the main way the ID3 algorithm works is at every step, you're trying to find the, the rules that make your data as imbalanced as possible. So as in like, let's say you have a decision, you make a rule, and then this rule will put 90% of examples, let's say in one bucket, and then 10% in another. Why? Think about what's the worst case. The worst case is if you have a rule that's 50-50, in which case it provides you no information, and there was like no reason for you to have that rule in the first place. So imbalance is good. So how do you find these imbalanced examples? Like, let's say you had a way of automatically generating some rules. Like, let's say you made them look like this. Like, you know, you aggregate some features or whatever. You could have some rule or some algorithm to, to design these uh, programmatically. Um, and then what you're essentially doing is you want to basically hear, where is it here? 
Yeah, so we split a test set of examples by a certain feature j and a threshold t, and the entropy of the split is a weighted sum of two entropies. So the, so the entropy of the of split is the entropy of the of both buckets, right? And so this is this is here the, the examples that were classified as negative over the total number of examples times the entropy of uh, the negative examples plus the entropy of the positive examples, right? Uh, and so, and then the, the way the entropy is measured is, you know, I think we should maybe just look at quickly entropy. Where's the plot? Yeah, it looks like this. Right, so just think of it as, like, as a function that looks like this. And the reason it's useful is basically the entropy reaches its maximum when the random variable can have only one value. Right, like that basically means that, uh, you know, like you're, you're, the further away you are from like a, from complete random uh, split, the, the better. Um, and so the way it's measured is basically here, like you have, what's F again? Let S denote a set of labeled examples and then decision tree only has a start node that contains all examples. Start with a constant model uh, where you basically do one over S and then sum over the Y's of all of X, Y over S. Okay. And then you take the log of the function ln. Yeah, so here, like, let me show you the formulation. So, so, so when you're thinking of the entropy, it sort of like measures your surprise, right? Like of, of, uh, on a certain data set. And what it looks like is that you're taking the negative of P of X, like the probability of some event times the log of P of X. So let's say if this was an F instead, then it would be X, uh, it would be F times a log of log of F. And then you take the negative of everything because otherwise it would be, uh, it would look like inverted instead. Right, again, this is an entropy of a coin flip. If you know that it's zero or one, then you have a minimum surprise. If it's anywhere in the middle, then it's, and if you know, like, I don't know, just games on the middle, that's the maximum entropy state. Right, so they also talk a bit about SVMs, uh, dealing with inherent nonlinearity. Okay, sure. Okay, nearest neighbor. Okay, I think we can get back to this later. So really, I think the, the like if, I, if I were to bet, like the most important idea I think you should uh, come out from this uh, video is, uh, is gradient descent. So I sort of talked about it briefly initially uh, here. And so with, with gradient descent, like you're, you're trying to think, always had a question about SVM, why is it called as a machine? That's a good question, actually. Why is why is SVM called a machine? Okay, this was a useless example. Like he's just sort of like, he's like, here's what SVMs are. And then it's like, well, I don't know what, actually where the name comes from. Like, thank you, man. Very useful. Good for you, you know what SVMs are. Okay, whatever. Almost felt like resume padding or something. Just like, okay, here, look at me. I have this knowledge. It's like, okay. Um, okay, so let's go back here, right? So, okay, so so this was like sort of like another example here. Like, remember, this is, you know, you have your yi, uh, and then, so this is your loss, and then wxi plus b is your model, right? 
So let me go back here. And when you're taking the derivative of this thing, you're gonna take it with respect to W and B. So these are both your parameters. So if you take it with respect to W, so let's, let's flush this out a bit, right? So you're gonna have uh, basically like here. So like WXI plus B, uh, you know, if we were to flush this out, then this would be uh, w, uh, w squared, no wait. xi looks like this whole thing is squared yeah okay so yeah yeah so then this works out like if, if you're taking the like hey basically if you have any function that looks like uh like something uh squared right and then you have some x here w plus b and you have some uh, d of uh, of w then this is gonna end up just looking like uh two like two xi right times whatever is inside uh, so that's exactly what this does right so it's like 2xi and then times what's inside and then there's a negative here so that's where the negative comes in um, yeah so here okay um, so we do the same thing here as well with respect to the to the b's uh, the the b's the difference is, is because it's a uh, you know, once you're driving, it's like it's a constant, right? So then you're just only going to have like this this two come out. Uh, that's like from the squared, and so you end up with this function as well. And so now, like the the trick is, well, you have to set this to zero. And where is it? We applied the chain rule. We initialize w0 through training examples. See wi is equal to alpha and then 2xi. Yeah, the code makes a lot more sense actually for this. Let me just show you this code. So here, okay. So for example, here, let's say, what did we try? What's the problem? So we have spending and sales. Spending and sales. So what's the, just, what's the x and what's the y? I just need to make sure of that. Right, so like this is what's interesting about this stuff is that like, well, remember, like once you have a model, like making a prediction is really just applying a function, right? It's like as, as soon as you know what W and X are, you can do this. So you learn the W and B by training, you you get uh, you have some sort of new X and you make a new prediction. Let's go back here. All right, so uh, initially, like, so, okay, so first off, you're, you're going to say, well, like N is equal to length of spendings, and then for I and range in N, what this means, like, iterate over all the examples. And for each example, update the value of W according to the lot, according to the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, right? So then this is your 2xi, so the spending is definitely our X, and then we're trying to predict sales. And then you multiply that sales minus, basically, this is the, your this is the target, right? And then this is the prediction. So uh, I'm just saying the support vector network is a learning machine from original paper about SVM. Oh, interesting. It's a muck, you know. Yeah, I guess so. I think it just sounded cool. It's probably sounds like the main motivation. It's just totally valid. Right. So once you have basically the values for the gradients, what you then need to do is you multiply the value of the gradient by, you basically update your original W, so you have this W is equal to W minus your gradient times alpha, which is a learning rate, which determines how quickly you change your parameters. So high alpha means you're gonna learn quickly, but training is gonna be more unstable. So like the best uh, examples, like let's say you're, going down this thing, like a very high alpha means you're gonna do this, then this, uh, then I don't know, this, then this. Whereas like a small grade, small alpha means you're just gonna slowly go down, uh, but training may be slower. So uh, like the lost landscape of actual real functions, it doesn't like, uh, like if a deep model, for example, is not gonna look like this, it's gonna look closer to something like this. Um, 
So there's like all sorts of stuff you can experiment with learning rates. Like there's like cyclical learning rates that are very good. Uh, you know, just a couple of tricks you can uh, you can end up using. But again, yeah, like hopefully this gives you like a better idea. Like right, so eventually, well, you're gonna just be updating this W and B uh, for all of your spending and sales, and you're gonna do this uh, for a number of epochs. Right, so epochs is the like uh, each epoch is basically a single pass through your data. So if you do 400 steps through your data, uh, what you're gonna do is you're basically just gonna keep optimizing it, and then you're gonna return a W and B. Once you have this W and B, then you can make a prediction by just doing W X uh, plus B. So very easy. All right, so this is sort of a meme, but it's not very far off from the truth. Uh, but basically a lot of times, like the way you actually implement this stuff is that you don't really need a big R&D budget. Like you don't really know to understand how this works. So you would just like come in, you would import linear regression from uh, scikit, and then you would call linear regression and then you fit it uh, here on an X and Y and it gives you back a model, right? And then you train this model and then you make a prediction and that's about it. So this is, uh, I would say, the vast majority of uh, like industrial ML work uh, is probably closer to this. So instead of you know replace scikit learn by uh, uh, Keras or PyTorch or uh, TensorFlow, uh, and you're not going to have uh, something that's uh, drastically different. Right. So basically saying like there, there's a lot of algorithms, right? So just, you know, make sure you use the right one for the job. Uh, and this is sort of like an unconventional uh, position, but I would say the often the right algorithm for the job is the like algorithm that you can deploy the fastest. So, you know, always start with that and then uh, go on towards more complicated stuff. All right, we're a third of the way. Okay, interesting. We'll see. I don't know if we'll have time to also go through data science from scratch because then maybe like a five hour stream, but let's see. I have to grab lunch at some point. Maybe I'll, I'll resume the second book uh, uh, after lunch or something. Um, so yeah, so basically when you, so remember when you're, when you're doing this fitting, right? Like you're fitting X's and these X's are uh, real numbers. Uh, or they could be, uh, you know, sorry, they need to be real numbers. But when you're actually looking at some data, it could be text, it could be a label, it could be an enum, it could be a float, it could be an int. So you basically need to turn all of these into real numbers whose values are between uh, zero and one, right? And so the reason you do that is so that like you don't end up having weights having larger magnitudes dominate uh, the like like the weights. Why? Like look at it. So I so say you have w one x one. Uh, plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 right so uh, this is for let's say here let's this is all the same example so this is x1 means feature one and x3 means uh, feature three so if you have an x is very big uh, what's going to end up happening when you're making a prediction is that you're just going to predict whatever the largest feature says you should predict uh, but you're not like so it's gonna have a disproportionate impact on the training. So that's why you basically do this uh, step called the normalization. So th there's a couple of uh, ways like so there's a couple of things you need to think about. Like one is uh, one hot encoding is like well if you have a uh, like a vector that looks like like says you have these classes right like red yellow, you could turn these into uh, like a just a you know like basically it's just a way to encode it like think of it as like the position means class one so this is class two this is class one so this is a very common way in which this is done another way is if you have things uh in a re in re that have real values is that you bin them so you say everything that's between zero and three value like that's class one uh like enum one sorry everything between three and five is enum two and so you would bin them and so that's sort of a way to reduce the dimensionality of your data set very popular uh, and I'd say this is probably the most important trick in uh, in, uh, in in preprocessing. So it's like the step called normalization. So let's look at this a bit. So this is X is your feature, right? So you want to change your feature such that you take the feature and then you minim and then you you put do it minus the minimal value of the feature across the whole data set divided by the max times the min, right? 
So if you if you work this out, what you'll see is that like regardless of what the feature is going to be here, which uh, I should range value, there's a range value typically in the interval of minus one to one zero. Um, here I'm telling. Yeah, actually, let me just show you an example because I think it makes it very obvious. So let's say I have uh, some sort of input data that looks like one, uh, four, five, so, so it looks something like this. Right, so this is my data. And so I want to develop a function called uh, normalize. So this function takes in an x, and then basically uh, for x i in x, right? What I want to do is I want to have let's call this like new x equals. So it's it's another array, and I want to say new x uh, dot append. Uh, let's call it new uh, x i, and then new x i is equal to xi minus minimum of x. And then I want to divide this by max of x minus minimum of x. Right, and then I want to return new x. And now let's print, so I'm going to say normalize x. Wait, did I do this right? So I took x minus min divided by max minus min. That's what I did, right? Oh, yes, sorry. Okay, yeah, so you see, like, after doing this kind of operation, like, all of your values are guaranteed to be between 0 and 1. Um, and so I often do this, by the way. Like, this is like a trick. If, if you get confused by some of the math, like, just, you know, work out an example, and you can convince yourself anecdotally that, you know, something like this should work. Um, I guess, like, another way to think about it is that, like, max minus min is guaranteed to be bigger than xi minus min, right? And so if a value here is guaranteed to be bigger, uh, this also means that you're always going to have something that's smaller than 1. Um, and then because this is always positive and this is always positive, then you're always going to have positive values between 0 and 1. That's like another maybe, uh, depending on how you like to think through things. I, I like to do this sometimes. Hope that was helpful. So the normalization basically means like make all the values strictly between 0 and 1. And another one is, is called uh, standardization, which is basically make sure that all of the values are uh, normally distributed, as in uh, basically you take, uh, basically all of, the, all of the values have 0 mean and variance 1, right? Uh, so this means that here, you, instead of just doing this, you would also take, the, this is the mean, and then this is the standard deviation. And if what ends up happening is that all of the values will look like they're normally distributed. And it's just like another way of, of making sure this, uh, this works a bit better. Uh, often real data sets will have missing data. So, uh, this, so the way to deal with this is via this uh, via data imputation, which basically means that, let's say take, let's say you have some example with a missing value, take like the average value that it, this feature typically has in this data set and then plug it in. So this is very common. There's other more complicated things you could do. Right, so then here he's saying, well, like, you know, to figure out what you want, like, do you need something to be explainable? Uh, you know, in which case, like, don't use deep learning. Uh, do you need to make predictions, like, online or offline? How many features do you have in examples? Uh, are you working with, like, categorical or numerical features, a mix of both? Like, how fast do you need your prediction to be? Uh, how fast do you need it to train? Uh, is your data nonlinear? Uh, in which case, like uh, an S a deep model or SVM would be great, but if it is linear, then like linear regression is going to be the fastest and by far the easiest to understand. So this is also like a chart that goes over. It's a pretty popular chart by the Scikit-Learn folks. 
Uh, so you can always take a look at something like this and figure out, uh, you know, if it makes sense to you. <clears throat> okay, so what does it mean to, to know that like a machine learning algorithm is doing well? And so remember when we first started talking about supervised learning, we basically said like, well, you pretend like you're, you can't look at the label. Uh, and then what you do is you basically look at the, the input data and try to predict the label, right? So the issue with this is that this, 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 this it's very possible to build a very complex model that fits your data perfectly if you do this. And so the way people typically resolve this problem is that you basically split your data between what's called training data, uh, test data, and validation data. Right, so the most important to, to understand are training data, which is basically uh, you can like here it's like pretend like you can't see example, then test data. You look at uh, like the actual label to give yourself a score. All right, so let's go over this quickly. Um, and then validation data is also important. Like here, let's let's go here. This is why these sets are often called holdout sets. Yeah. So there's no optimal way to split these out. Like typically, I've seen arbitrary ratios from like 70, 30. Typically, people like to have more data in their uh, training data than in their test data. Uh, but you could always do that. And so learning algorithm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So they also briefly here mentioned validation data and essentially like a lot, a lot of algorithms will have like hyperparameters, like let's say learning rate is one of them. And so you could train your algorithm on five different hyperparameter configurations on five different subsets of the data and then see which one is best and then pick that best one and use that for your test set. Um, ultimately though, what I've seen in practice is that because like data is so valuable is that like you typically would rather train everything uh, you know, with like you would rather not have actually, I think, a validation set. Uh, that said, it sort of depends are you in the large data regime or the small data regime? Maybe if you're in the small data regime, it doesn't matter too much. Like if your model is like a line or something, but for deep models, I've typically seen, I haven't seen validation sets be very popular anymore. So we talked a lot about overfitting and underfitting, but yeah, like let's say that we you have this example. You know, we could say, well, maybe this is a line, but here it looks like, well, if it's a parabola, it fits a bit better, but if it's like a degree 15, then, you know, yeah, it fits it, but we feel like this is too complicated, All right? And so what's like a, a way to, you know, systematically reduce how complicated a model is? Uh, assume that you have something like this linear regression model right here. Uh, we could take a, this a one regularized objective, which is basically not only do we want to minimize the loss, we want to minimize the loss and uh, you want to minimize the loss and minimize the magnitude of the weights, right? So then the C parameter is just a constant that determines how important we think this is. And ideally, instead of just this looking like this, if I said C here and then here times this, this the second part of the expression, 1 minus C, then you can think of C as a scalar between 0 and 1 that helps you trade off how important it is for your model to be complex versus how important is it for you to uh, fit your data well. And then L2 loss is the, is the same, but instead you're you're minimizing the, the squared of the of the distance of the of the, of the weights. A lot of times when you're debugging a model, like people like to think of accuracy, but what's actually much more useful is a confusion matrix. So if confusion matrix will tell you, well, out of examples, like so, it, it basically cr does a cross section of your predictions, like which were positive and negative, and then were they actually positive or negative on those two respective examples. Uh, and so let's say let's take the example of a spam classifier. Like in the case of a spam classifier, uh, it's okay if some example is a spam as long as you don't miss important emails. So it's actually more important that you don't miss important emails than it is that you get a bit of spam. And so that trade-off ends up determining like what, what you want to do. And so the two metrics to sort of uh, help you measure these, like, like one way is the confusion matrix, but uh, ultimately if you just want to, let's say, plot this, like because you can't just plot the matrix, uh, uh, is what you would do. I mean, you could plot these four values, I guess, but 
what you would end up doing is that you would uh, basically plot precision and you would plot recall. Uh, and precision, if you look at the formulation, it's like your true positive. So which examples did you predict were positive and were actually positive? Divided by the true positive plus, plus the false positive. False positives are actually negative examples that you predicted as positive. Right? And so then recall the true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So false positive basically t is basically, uh, it's something that you predicted as a positive and true positive is something you predicted as a positive. So what precision is measuring is out of the positive examples that you gave, how many were actually positive, right? Whereas recall is basically telling you how many of the actually positive examples did you find, right? And so, because false negative is actually a, a, like an actually positive value. So it's like, I'll do this, like actually positive. And then wrongly predicted. That's part of, so this, this is why they're called precision and recall. So precision is telling you how precise are your classifications. Like if, if you said something is positive, how likely is it to be positive? Whereas recall is saying, well, how many of the positive stuff did you find in the data set? So that's why it's called recall. Right, so uh, like another way to do this more systematically <clears throat> is people will actually plot true positive and false, and so the true positive rate and the false positive rate uh, side by side, and you're gonna end up with some sort of chart. And the area of this chart gives you some sense, under this chart gives you some sense of how accurate your predictions are. So this is like another way to, to think about it. Um, so remember I said that uh, you know, and, and ML algorithms, like there's many hyperparameters that you need to solve for. So one of them, obvious ones is learning rate. Another one, let's say, could be number of arguments. Another one could be your initialization algorithm or whatever, or your kernel. So what's the best one? Typically, you try them all out via this algorithm called grid search, which is basically just a form of brute force search. And you decide what ends up being best for your use case. <clears throat> all right. So yeah, so we're finally to neural, at, at neural networks right now. So in the case of neural networks, like here, you'll notice that it's a composition of a bunch of functions. So imagine that this was logistic regression. So you're going to have f of 3 times f of 2, sorry, composed with f of 2, f of 1. So you compose these functions one after the other, and, and this gives you a pretty good sense of, uh, of how this works. All right, so, so far, so good. You know, okay, this is all great and all. So what's an activation? So one thing like I, I've called, basically I've memed this before, but neural networks are basically a matrix, like nonlinearity, then matrix, uh, then nonlinearity. And this keeps going. <clears throat> So what's an example of a nonlinearity? Well, there, there's two ones that are used, like there's ReLU and then there's tan H. So what ReLU looks like is, uh, it looks like this. So boom, right? So it's zero if it's X is less than, uh, if Z is less than zero. Otherwise it's basically just follows it exactly. So what this does is it like basically zeros out stuff that are negative. And for stuff that's positive, it keeps it. Let's just look at what 10H looks like very quickly. Right? Looks like a sigmoid. So, you know, so this is, this just looks like a regular softmax. So one would use one over the other. I think there was a good tutorial I saw on loss functions. I think it was this one. Yeah, so you see, for example, like this is cross entropy is used for, uh, like remember the power thing we did? Like the power we, that we did earlier when we were doing logistic regression loss was really just a trick uh, that you can use to figure out uh, like basically whether, like to have a different loss or whether your prediction was positive or negative. Uh, another one's hinge loss. There's scale divergence, like the difference in uh, in uh, distributions. 
uh, mean absolute error is used more for uh, like regressions. Let's see, optimizers, there's a whole bunch of them as well. Add a grad, add a delta, RMS prop and momentum. Okay, yeah, sure. It's a whole bunch of regularization techniques. Oh yeah, sorry, I want to show you the activation layers. I apologize. So here with the activation layers, for example, like well, one activation is linear. Uh, the other one is like this uh, this exponential linear unit, right? So let's see here. Uh, it's a it's an alternative to to Relu. The benefit of Relu is that it's very simple. Uh, but and you can also compute this faster, right? Because you're not computing exponentials to do anything. You're just spitting out like this. This is a it's an if condition, right? Uh, so it's very very fast. Um, a real leaky ReLU lets you have like small non-zero values. So this is like another variant of it. Uh, there's sigmoid. It's easy to work with. It has like nice properties. Uh, but it can make the model like slower. Tan uh, H. Basically, the gradient is stronger and steeper, which means it's going to learn faster. Uh, but it's going it, to it's going it's going to learn faster. But that means that the gradient can also be unstable. Uh, so yeah, like these are all like this is a very good guide by the, the ML cheat sheet. So make sure to check it out. Here, I'll put it in chat quickly. All right, let's go here. So, so there's a couple of neural network architectures you should be aware of. Like when it comes to image problems, uh, typically convolutional neural networks are king and specifically an architecture called ResNet. And what ResNet basically means, like remember when you have the structure of matrices, uh, we call these residual connections because they can skip stuff. So it's a way of basically making sure that you don't end up with a vanishing gradient problem that uh, uh, like feedback Feedback is feedback remains, uh, but for sequences, another very popular architecture is LSTMs, uh, which is also like again another way to deal with the vanishing gradient problem. So looking at CNNs, the way that you can think about them is that they're, they're also a form of uh, like basically they're a generalization of matrix multiplication where you can make the matrices smaller and then scan them. So they're a generalization because imagine if the convolution operation is as big as the matrix and you don't need to move it at all, just move it once. Uh, and so let's say we look, we take a look at this, All right? So imagine that you're gonna multiply each of these values here. Like let's say, well, you have this minus one uh, times one, so that's minus one. Then you have this two times zero, it's a zero. So we have minus one, then four. So then we have a three, and then we have a minus two, minus zero. So we have three plus one, and that's the four, All right? So this is how the convolution operation works, and then you just keep scanning this thing uh, across it. All right, so here the softmax operation is again used for classifications where you're trying to figure out like well out of many classes uh you know let's say out of 10 classes like what's the most likely one you would basically take the exponential of uh, the value of the for feature and sum it up over the prediction of everyone else's and that gives you a, a sense of uh, of how this works so these are these are the equations for lstms like they look complicated but they're all like think of them again as like matrix multiplies uh, with feedback loops and stored state. And the stored state idea is important because uh, you could have the prediction be different, like basically the history matters. And so you need some way of encoding that in the network. There's variations like bidirectional RNNs. I've used these at work before for any sort of NLP tasks because a language sort of has meaning both in, in, in both directions. Right, so here they talk about stuff like kernel regression, multi one class classification. Uh, so one class classification is interesting. Let's say you just have like a single class, you want to predict whether this is the case. Multi class is well, you have a you have a couple. Like what do you do? Let's keep going. Multi label. So multi label means that you could have like let's say in an image both a dog and a cat. So how do you predict like a vector of labels? Similar idea actually, to the regular one. 
ensemble learning <clears throat> is, is very used, like I'd say, in, like in Kaggle competitions. Uh, so basically, let's say you have uh, two models that each do better than, thank you, Habibi. That each do better than, I started losing my voice. Uh, that each do better than a coin flip, like 51% and 51%. And let's say you have like 100 of these, then you can end up with a classifier that gets 90% 90, 90 accuracy. And so this is sort of like, I'd say like one theoretical underpinning for how like democracy can work. Like how, like, let's say people's individual decisions can be a bit worse than a coin, a bit better than a coin flip. But as a result, you can have like society move forward in, in interesting ways. That's if they are, uh, if their predictions are all indeed independent, actually. So I'm having some tea because I'm losing my voice. I mean, any questions so far? I feel like I'm going very, very fast in this section. So let me know if I am. Okay, all right. So moving on. When, when you think about like ways of aggregating uh, models, there's sort of two ways of, of doing it. So there's like basically a uh, random forest and gradient boosting. Actually, I wonder how to check about like XJ boost. Uh, okay, gradient boosting library. Okay, so Kirsten is asking, could you please comment what is explainability when it comes to neural networks and what are they working on when they say they are, um, working on explainable neural networks. Okay. Uh, I will preface the rest of my explanation with saying like, this is a, an area where there's a lot of snake oil salesmen, like people selling bullshit algorithms that don't work or define it in some sort of way according to them. So um, the interesting, like your question is very on point because there is no clear, clear definition. What I will say though, is that there's a good book about it by Chris Molnar, yeah, this guy. So I think this was the best book that sort of talks about uh, some of the, so some of these ideas. And then I think like Aspen at Princeton, explainable AI and bias was also very good. Okay, I forget where that book was, but there's multiple ways in which people define explainable AI. One is people will say something like, well, uh, you know, like it's not random. So if I give it the same example, I'm always gonna get the same prediction. Or sometimes they'll say, well, uh, you can do counterfactual analysis. Like, let's say you, you remove some features, like let's say like race, and then try to figure out if the model actually makes the same predictions. And the idea is that if it makes different predictions with race, then then, it, then, then without it, then you have a racist model and you should change that. Uh, another one is, for example, assuming like adversarial examples, like how robust are your adversarial, adversarial examples? In general, what I want you to come out from this long-winded explanation is that this is a very wide open field. People are desperate for a good explanation as to what explainable models are. I don't think there is one. I think it's more of a process as in you slowly become more aware of issues with your models and slowly improve it such that you don't affect uh, certain classes of people more than others. And so you need like a combination of ethicists and people like looking at the model and slowly thinking about it and thinking about what could work or what isn't. But I find it extremely questionable that we'll ever have like a piece of software uh, that you can just like run on a black box model and be like, you know, it is now explainable and not racist. Like, I don't think this is feasible, at least in the next couple of years. Uh, I'm, you know, pleasantly often, like, I mean, generally, like, I'm happy to be optimistic and, you know, maybe someone will figure it out, but uh, that hasn't happened. And there's a big need for it. Like, why, right? Like, let's say if you basically build a model for something like this that works reliably, like this is a multi-billion dollar problem because you're removing the threat of lawsuits from pharmaceutical companies and banks. Like, no one wants to be in a public lawsuit where they're being uh, called racist. Like, no one wants to be in a situation where they're actually being racist. So if you can remove that headache, like you're going to be a billionaire. It's just a very hard problem to solve. And no one's solved it yet. So yeah, so moving on in the, in the book. Um, so what a random forest is, so here, like, okay, so they, they talk about like there's two techniques, like bagging and boosting. So bagging is basically making multiple copies of the data set. Uh, and then you train the same model on multiple copies of the data set. And then you use that as a way to aggregate aggregate information across them. 
And so basically here, like in the case of boosting, uh, you basically just take a, a majority vote, let's say, between uh, all of the predictions of all of your models. Bagging. Wait, why do they talk about boosting here? Oh, yeah. So we're getting boosting. So if you look at, okay, so we have some regression problem. Okay, so we're doing this. Then we modify the labels for each example in our training set like follows, where yi is a residual. Oh, interesting. I see, I see. Okay. So the difference between bagging, so bagging is sort of, you have a bunch of classifiers that you've trained in parallel. You make them all aggregate each other. What boosting is, is you have a classifier that predicts some examples. Then you look at all the examples that it predicted wrong, and then you train another classifier to solve that. And then you continue this process ad infinitum, and that's what gradient boosting is. Okay, so then you know, then you can also learn to label sequences. You know, like again, neural networks work over data. Like let's say uh, a matrix. Like remember, so uh, neural networks. Like they're, they're like remember, I call them matrix networks, right? So they take uh, some input data as a matrix, and then they can output some output data as a matrix. Uh, think of a graph, right? Like a graph can be represented as an adjacency matrix, A, which means that you can neural networks can operate over arbitrary data structures. They don't need to work over mathematical objects. Like any data structure that you can think of uh, can probably be represented like a graph. And so if you can do that, then you can train anything and with a neural network and make it output anything you want. That's one of the reasons like why they have like this like amazing representation power is because like the their input space is just so abstract that they can do whatever they want. Uh, yeah, so some sequence to sequence architecture like with attention. So attention is basically, uh, you can think of it like a graph where you have a, a point, pay attention to various other elements of itself. Sorry, like a sequence where an individual token can pay attention to other elements of that token. Uh, active learning is essentially this idea that lets you pick which examples you want to classify next, and the idea is you would pick the ones that, let's say, would maximize your surprise. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, I talked a lot about, like autoencoders are one way of doing this, where uh, you know you have like this encoder, the decoder architecture, so you're trying to predict an input from itself. So all of the birth ideas, they're sort of motivated a lot by this. Uh, essentially, by forcing the model to be become smaller near the middle, you're forcing it to compress its representation, and then you're sort of testing how how good its compression was by making it slowly bigger. Okay, one shot learning. Okay, uh, imbalanced data sets. So, in a lot of data sets, like let's say you have, uh, uh, you know, let's say you want to have a language classifier. And, and then in this language classifier, it needs to work over all languages. Like by definition, the model is going to do worse on, let's say, Lebanese Arabic, right? Because there's few people that speak Lebanese Arabic in the world. And so how do you deal with this problem? So one way to deal with this problem is that for, uh, for the rare examples, you label them more than once. So basically, you, you basically pretend like there's more Lebanese speakers than there actually are. Uh, another way to do it is uh, to make the cost of failure on those predictions higher than other examples. So there's multiple ways of doing this. Like I think there's no silver bullet. But yeah, here, so you see there's adaptive sampling, minority oversampling, uh, you know. But there's no, I would say, like clear uh, solution for how to do this. When we talked about combining models, you know, we said like there's averaging, and there's a majority vote, stacking, multiple ways you can aggregate models. Uh, regularization, okay, yeah, so uh, regularization here, this is this mostly comes up in the context of neural networks, but these are sort of tricks that always works. Like dropout is sort of universally used where you essentially zero out some models, some weights in your model uh, such that to make it more robust to what those nodes are actually doing. Uh, batch normalization is a way for you to essentially take in a, a batch of data and then normalize the features across that batch. Early stopping is basically, well, if you know that your model isn't doing that much of a good job anymore, you can just stop the training and then restart a new training. So these are all good tricks. So here, essentially, this is configured by a parameter called patience. So basically, if, you're, if your algorithm doesn't improve, uh, dropout is you know used almost universally right now. I would say most CNNs today, they look like convolution, 
you know, drop out batch normalization. All right, so this, if you think of this as a module, and then you do this 50 times, and you end up with ResNet 50. So if you actually look at the code, this is literally how it's done. It's like, they'll just have like a for loop that says like, for, you know, uh, I and 50, uh, compose these functions 50 times, one after the other. Uh, handling multiple inputs is always like, for me, at least a very interesting thing. Like, let's say you have two inputs, you can compose them uh, into a single vector and then feed it into a network. So that's how you can handle multiple inputs. Similarly, you can handle multiple outputs if you have two loss functions. So a lot of reinforcement learning uses this trick. Uh, and I'd highly recommend you can just check out Keras for how multiple inputs and out outputs are, are uh, resolved. All right, so here also like in unsupervised learning, it's not just really about clustering, like density estimation is essentially a way to, to bucket data uh, very quickly. There's also clustering, k-means is like building some centroids on some data so that you can like visually inspect the differences among them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones. How you determine the number of clusters, this is also, there's a couple of ideas, but I'd say like the, the, the main one I think about is that like, well, you basically start with uh, one and two, and then you s increase it until t until you see uh, diminishing returns in the total average distance to the centroids. There's obviously like more complex uh, algorithms. Uh, I haven't used them personally. I don't know anyone in industry that does either. So yeah, lots of stuff about clustering. Yeah, dimensionality reduction is interesting. So this also fell out of favor recently because you can think of neural networks, like let's say you have a matrix here, like matrix one and matrix two. Actually, let me draw this a bit differently. If you have like M1, and then you have like an M2 that looks like this, this is essentially a form of dimensionality reduction. Like you're forcing the representation in this layer to fit the smaller layer. Uh, but other ways this has traditionally been done is principal component analysis. And what principal component analysis is basically, it's again, looking at the features that change the most because those will be most indicative of like basically the intrinsic dimensionality of your manifold of your data. So if you're like in n dimensions, like can you find k dimensions such as the k such as those k dimensions change the most? Again, like what what are the what's the optimal k? You know who knows? There's multiple algorithms to do this. Um, also related is the problem of outlier detection. I'd say this is a very common industry problem. Uh, where you're basically trying to find like data points that don't fit your clusters uh, there because they're most likely to be either be interesting or errors or fraud or something like that. Uh, you know, you can learn metrics, like what's you can learn to rank. Uh, let's say, so your lambda mart, mean average precision. So uh, yeah, so th the interesting thing about ranking metrics is that like you, you may want, like let's say you, you're, you're ranking, like you have 10 things like 10 items that you want to rank. Let's say this is Google search. Uh, you want to weigh the first element in the search a lot higher than the future ones because that's the one that people are most likely to click on. Uh, and so you would basically add a form of decaying exponential uh, to your loss functions where like let's say element one times e to the minus k, right? And then you keep going on to, 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 reduce, uh, to reduce this weight. Um, so recommend your engines, like again, like this whole uh, wide open field, you can do all sorts of stuff here. Uh, word embeddings are interesting. It's basically a way to turn a word from the one hot encoding into like a vector such that the words that have similar meanings will have similar vectors. And I think that's it. There's other stuff like let's say Gaussian processes, which is assuming that like using an infinite number of Gaussians to model your data. I don't know who uses them anymore. Probabilistic graphical models are interesting because a graphical model is really just a probability distribution. And so you're basically encoding some more structure on your model. But again, the benefit of neural networks is that they work with no structure. But if you do have some structure, you're essentially making the problem easier for your network. Others are used quite a bit in finance, like Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is you're basically uh, sampling. And I like the most famous example is like, let's say you're trying to predict Let's say you're, you're trying to predict, let's say the radius of a, like the area of a circle. Uh, 
And what you would do is basically sample some random points and then you count the number of points that were inside versus outside and that gives you some sense of the total average of, uh, uh, like, like, like the average of, uh, of, of, the, of the area. Uh, genetic algorithms are basically a way to, if you have a guess, you can adaptively change it by taking uh, the good guesses and breeding them with each other by, let's say, taking an average among them. Uh, reinforcement learning, I talk a lot about uh, in, in my ebook, so maybe I'll talk about this in some other time. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, like I'm losing my voice, guys. So, I, so this was a lot of information, I think, but it sort of covers, I think, all the basics of machine learning. Uh, thank you for the subscribe. I really appreciate it, Hector. Thank you. Uh, so this hopefully covers like all the basics of machine learning that you need to know about, like whether you're applying for a job or just like want to refresh or just like want to know a bit more about machine learning. So stay tuned. I may stream later today or maybe tomorrow more on the, the other book, the, the Data Science from Scratch book, which covers more code as opposed to theory. I think it'll be even more interesting than this session. So yeah, so this was interesting. Make sure to subscribe and thank you so much for joining everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you.